Okay, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Doing good. Good to see you. Sorry about the screen. I think we've had some residual water damage that's probably messing with our projector, with our screen, so we'll endeavour to get that fixed this week. So we can go ahead and shut that off, I reckon, if it's going to be flickering, less distraction. Welcome, and good to see you all. Good to be at church this morning. I've got an exciting update. I've got, I feel like I, I, I kind of start every message with that. So that's good. I've got an exciting update this morning regarding our Melrose Fund. Last week, we were at $15,000. Our first project to fund is the playground, which we need $35,000 for. The stretch goal was $70,000, which the, the, the extra $35,000, good on your good math state, is, is going to be used for the heating and cooling in this room. And also, we need a bit of a lighting update because all the lighting's are kind of lighting is busted, except for these fairy lights, pretty much. Last week, we were at fifteen thousand dollars. I said, guys, one more week, twenty eighth of March, we're going to announce what we've raised. And I got some exciting news. As of Friday, we have raised sixty five thousand dollars, two hundred and fifty. Come on, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> wow. We raised $50,000 in one week. Huge. Could I just say a massive thank you? We are $4,750 short of our target. So if we get almost at $5,000, we've completely reached our target. So what I want to say is, it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. If you're thinking, oh, I forgot, that's fine. We kind of forget stuff like that all the time. Life is busy. But if you still want to give, you can. The Melrose Fund is still open, Okay. So, good news is we've fully funded the playground. It's happening. It's going to be happening. Yes. It's going to be awesome. We are going to start construction on that in the next couple of months. We've already started preparing things out there. It's going to be great. And we're fully funded. The lighting in here, we just need that five grand more to get the heating and cooling going. Maybe I should do the announcement again in the middle of winter, and that would make a difference. Or the middle of summer, I don't know. But anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you. The fund is still open, you still can give. Can I, can I just give thanks? Let's just, let's just praise God and thank Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the generosity of your people. We thank you for the, the funds that you have entrusted to us and the leadership here at the church. I pray that we'd use them well. We'd use them not just to make things look pretty, but we'd, we'd build infrastructure to fund a vision, proclaiming the hope of Jesus to this area and beyond. We want people to meet you, Lord, and so we pray that, that every dollar we put into this place would do that thing, that very thing. We thank you for this generosity. May this church be continue to be known as a generous church. In Jesus' name we pray together. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So good. All right. Well, let's kick off the message for today, we are in our series, <clears throat> excuse me, called <clears throat> The Storyteller. It's Jesus teaching on the parables, these, these little stories with big meanings, these little stories that kind of, oh, they seem innocent, but they make their way past our carefully guarded masks into our hearts, hopefully, and sort of irritate us and gnaw away at us with their meaning. Today we're looking at maybe the most famous. We looked at the Good Samaritan about a month ago. Okay, that's probably the most famous. But second might be the parable of the prodigal son. Or as I, I like to call it, the lost sons. We're looking at this today. And it, it, we're probably very familiar with this story. I think a lot of us are very familiar, particularly with the younger son's story, his narrative. Because maybe for some of us, it's our story. And that's my story, wandering away far from God, thinking that that was what life was about, running away from responsibility. That's where freedom and joy is. But then realizing our mistake and coming back to the grace and mercy of our great God, that was my story. Maybe that's your story. And so it's, it's quite a familiar story because of that. We're going to be exploring that this morning, and we're going to see an incredible incredibly beautiful picture of grace, but we're going to see more. There's actually more than that for us here in this parable. This parable, Jesus teaches us something radical found nowhere else outside the Bible. Jesus is trying to teach us something extremely important when it comes to how we relate to God. There's two different ways, therefore, two different sons. 
It would be dangerous not to look at how both brothers act toward the father and how the father acts towards them. So, and as, we, as we're going to do that, as we're going to look at that, we're going to see the Christian gospel articulated in a fresh and powerful way. So let's dive in. Sam read so well for us before, started the, the reading for us today, a few verses before the story of the prodigal son. Here's why, a bit of context. These are the first couple of verses. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, that's the teachers of the law, the religious folks, muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then, in this context, Jesus told three parables. Now, two weeks ago, do you remember Jonathan Appel spoke so well on the parable of the lost sheep? And he said, there's a trilogy of parables. And he said, the second one might be the best because Empire Strikes Back is the best in the Star Wars series. I, wanna, I think Return of the Jedi is better, my friend. So it, we're looking at the third, so maybe that's the best. But we see these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin. And in these stories, there's someone who seeks the lost. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of talk about the lost, right? Lost sheep, lost, lost coin, lost sons. Why so much talk about the lost? And it's this reason. God cares about the lost. His heart is for the lost. In the first two parables, the main character is concerned with seeking what's been lost. Right? They don't just write it off, cost of doing business. We lost one sheep, we've got 99, that's pretty good. We've got lots of coins, we've lost one. I mean, come on, that's not so bad. No, no. He's concerned. The person in the story is concerned about seeking what is lost. Now, this had the religious folks of the day muttering to themselves. They didn't get it. Jesus seems to be a, a guy from God. He never done anything wrong. Miracles. His teaching's amazing. He's a religious folk. He should be hanging out with us religious folks. We've devoted our careers, our lives to pursuing God. He should be hanging out with us because we're the ones who are in, right? Ah, we're going to look at that today. Today, we're redefining who's in and who's out. Who is really lost and who is really found? You see, the sinners that are gathering around Jesus, tax collectors and sinners, they're the obvious lost. Are you with me? You know, it's, and Jesus extends his loving hand of grace to those who recognize their spiritual need for a savior. I mean, that's why he came. Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why I'm here. But in the third parable we're looking at today, the parable of the lost sons, we see with even greater clarity what lost actually means. Jesus redefines lostness. Is that a word? It is now. He redefines lostness. He redefines actually what we would call sin. There are two sons in this story. Therefore, I think, two ways to live, two ways to approach life, two ways to approach God. And here's the thing. Are you ready? They're both wrong. They're both wrong. What does that mean? It means this, we need a third way. We need a completely different way to relate to God. What is it? Okay, stay with me, we're going to get there. Now, I will admit, this isn't the shortest message I've ever written. It's two sons. You could do a sermon each at least on both of them. So I've tried to combine them. So just I'm asking for extra measures of grace. We're in this together. Don't make me go on my own. I'll try and be as quick as I can. You know, on podcasts, how you can make it like 1.5. I'm going to try and do that. It's going to be fast. Let's dive into the parable of self. A man had two sons, we're told immediately. And the younger son asks for something truly and utterly unthinkable from the father. You know the story. Even by today's standards, it's brazen. Dad, give me my share of the inheritance now. I mean, imagine doing that to your parents. Hey, I don't want to wait till you die to get my share handed over now. I mean, today it's shocking. Back then it was absolutely unthinkable. Of course, parents are free to help out their kids with baby boomer money, right? Of course, that's totally fine. But demanding your share now, can you imagine the insult? What is it saying? You may as well be dead to me. You're as good as dead to me. I don't really care about you. I just, I just want you to give me what you can give me. Hand over the cash. I mean, the rudeness, the uncaring nature of it, the heartless, callous behavior of the son. We're supposed to feel the weight and the insult, okay, of what it does to the father. The humiliation the father experiences is profound. The crowd back then would have just gone, oh, as Jesus told this story. I mean, no, how dare he? Now, we're not told what the father says to the son. Maybe he didn't say anything. We're not told what he feels. 
Here's the crazy thing what happens. Ready? The father does it. The father does it. He divides up his estate, gives the son his portion. It's shocking. Well, it doesn't take long for the younger son to take off after that. He's got what he wants. Heads off for a more exciting adventure. He can't wait to leave the boundaries of the family home and set out for everything he reckons his dad's been holding out on him. What a killjoy! All those rules, all that hard work, all that obligation, I can't wait to have all that in my rear view mirror. This is the younger son. Now I'm finally free to do what I want any old time. What is this? What is this way of living? It's self-discovery, isn't it? Right? It's, if this is what true freedom looks like, right? Is it? The vision of paradise the younger son has quickly becomes what it is. What is it? A mirage. It's never what you think. What he, he grasps, oh, this is, this, is, this is it for me. This is what's going to satisfy me. This is life-giving water. It turns out to be sand choking in his throat. Now, we're told pretty quickly he spends all he has. It only takes a verse to unravel. We don't know how much money he had. It's a significant amount, I imagine, but it doesn't last long. We're just told he just burns through it on wild living. That's some wild living. What happened to his fabulous vision of an unrestricted life? Doesn't look too free. His money running out, his money running out coincides with a famine, right? So it's tough, double whammy. And we're told something crucial. Listen to this. He, we're told something crucial. He began to be in need. You can imagine him back home thinking, what do I need? Man, I need, I need my pockets to be full of money. You know, I need to get the heck out of here. I mean, now we see real need. His choices are left him cold. He experiences true need. Now, let's just press pause for a second. I want to talk about something. This highlights the only requirement for the Christian faith, and it's this, need. The only must-have to receive the gift of grace. It's the only deal-breaker. In this whole thing, all you need is need. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling, says the old hymn. Now with his money gone, food hard to come by, he takes any job he can get. It doesn't get any more pathetic than this. For a Jewish person, taking a job feeding pigs, lowest of the low. And this guy, no one's being kind to him, he's got nothing to eat, he's longing to eat what the pigs are eating. Oh man, low. And it's at this moment he gets a revelation and makes a plan. Here's what I've got to do. I'm going to head home. My servants have way more to eat than I have now. They're treated way better than I am at the moment. I'm going to head back. What I've done is unforgivable. I know that I've sinned against my father. I've sinned against heaven. It's so obvious. Here's my plan. Here's his plan. And it kind of makes sense to us. Make me like a servant. I know I can't be a son anymore. I've forfeited that. But make me a servant and maybe I'll try and repay everything I've spent. It's impossible. I can never do it on a servant's wage. But, but how else am I going to make things right? So he gets up, leaves the pigs to their food, sets off home. Now what happens next? I don't know if you can have favorite parts of the Bible, but I kind of do here. This is, what happens next is one of the most beautiful scenes in the whole Bible. Let me try and illustrate that for you. Here it is. And here's why, okay? Because Jesus is telling us in this parable what? What God is like. That's why Jesus, there's more things to learn. We're going to learn more. But Jesus is telling us what our Father God is like. Because the Father in the story, of course, represents our Father God. So what happens? The son, the younger son, heads home. And while he's still a long way off, the Father spots him. Have you noticed something about that? You can't spot someone very far away unless you're looking for them, can you? So what's the father been doing? He's had the binoculars out, waiting, watching for his son. He was waiting for him to return, longing for the day when the son would appear on the horizon, when he'd come to his senses and return to him. The father sees him while he's still a long way off, and what does he do? What's he thinking and feeling at that moment? What is it? What would be natural maybe for us to feel? About time that dropkick son of mine came to his senses. 
Right, there he is. Okay, ready everybody? Let's put him to work. He can start repaying every single dollar he swindled out of me. Or even just the, where the heck have you been? Right? I mean, some of that might ring true from our experiences. Is that how the Father God reacts? No, friends, you know it. No. We're told what? He's filled with compassion. He's filled with compassion for his son, and it leads him to action. He runs to his son. Now, you might not think much of that, but wealthy and respected men back then didn't run. Children and servants, they can run. Wealthy men didn't run. But the father could care about cultural norms. He runs and embraces his son and kisses him. He embraces his wayward, pig-smelling, party boy son and lands a kiss right on him. This is the character of God, friends. This is who we worship. This is our Father God, embracing every runaway that would return to him. Now, I don't think we have the screen, do we? Pete, is someone... Okay, cool, we don't have it, but that's all right. I had a picture. The only one, the only slide I have for this message was a picture of a beauty. You can Google it later on by a sculpture by the, by the name of Charlie Mackesy. It's called The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's this beautiful picture, and it's capturing this moment when the father embraces the son as he comes home. I've seen the real thing in, in the UK, and Charlie Mackesy came to faith later in life, and he's just obsessed with this story because I think it's his. And he has painted and sculpted so many different versions of this thing. It's called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And when you see it, you just... I love art, you know, it just captures the emotion. It captures so much. Up close, you can see the emotion of the father. You can feel him tightly embracing the son, pulling him closer. And you can feel the son kind of surrender the weight to the father. Friends, this isn't just a nice story. It's not just a nice story. It's not just a nice piece of art that I'm explaining. It's the very character of God. It's the heart of our father. And because of the cross, this can happen. All sin is forgiven. All can be welcomed home. All we need to do is turn around and repent. I've got to ask this morning, do you need to come home? Are you a younger son? Well, the younger son still tries to get his prepared speech out. You know how he prepared it in the pigsty? He comes, he, he's, the father's embraced him, tears wiping away. He's, well, um, look, I, I know I'm not, I've, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Make me a servant. I'm not worth Father cuts him off. Interrupts him. Quick, get the best robe. Get the family ring. Get sandals on his feet. Prepare a feast. It's time to celebrate. Cover my son's filthy stained clothes with a clean robe. Take the pressure off his blistering and sore bare feet with sandals. Place the family ring on his finger. What's that mean? Denoting his place of honor in the family. Kill the fattened calf. That doesn't mean much to us, but back then you only did that at the most outlandish celebrations. You saved it for something special. Why? Verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What a beautiful verse that is. But not everyone is happy. Not everyone is happy in the household. There is one in the family who can't handle this love fest. And it's the elder brother. He comes in from the field. He's missed what's going on. He hears the commotion. Asks the servant, what's going on? The servant says, your brother's home. Crazy. We all thought he was gone. He's never coming back. But he's returned home and we're celebrating. It's party time. Come on. There's a crazy feast happening in the house. Let's do it. Think about it, right? It's a time to rejoice. This is the only sibling he has. Apart from his father, his only living relative. My only brother who has lost his home. Rejoice, right? What are we told? We're told the older brother became angry and refused to go into the party. The older brother became angry and refused to go into the party. Why? Well, let's spend a few moments exploring that together. Now, what does the father do? Again, full of grace, comes out of the feast, overlooking this insult from his elder son, who won't come in. I mean, that's shameful. But grace to the younger brother, grace to the older brother, he comes out and pleads with him to come inside. 
Friends, God, God loves Pharisees. We're going to see this in a moment. He loves religious folk just as much as he loves wayward sons. Now we're going to see what's going on in the heart of the elder brother. What does the elder brother say? The father comes out, pleads with him. What does the older brother say? Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me anything. You never gave me even a young goat to celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returns, you see that he can't bear to call him my brother. He distances it. When this son of yours returns, after wasting all our money, you kill the fattened calf for him? How could you do that? Look at all I've done in the family, and you do this for a son that spat in your face? And here is the ultimate shock of the parable. This is what truly sets it apart. Look at this. The younger brother... Where's he? He's at the feast. Where does the older brother end up? Outside. What? What's going on here? The one who did a big, you know, thanks but no thanks to the father, ends up being with the father. And at the end, the one who does everything right is outside. What's going on here? Jesus is redefining who's in and who's out. Who's lost and who's found? He's redefining what alienates us from God. Now, what does that mean? Let's have a look. Are you with me? Let's have a look. Let's have a look at the two brothers and their actions. Ready? Both represent the two ways in which we live, two worldviews, two approaches, two reactions to God. The younger brother, we've seen it. What is it? Self-discovery. I can really relate to this, right? This was me. Throw off the shackles of responsibility, expectations of community, parents, and seek freedom in doing what? Anything and everything else. And I think most, most of us would go, traditionally, especially when looking at what he did the Father, we would say that's kind of sinful. That's wrong, wouldn't we? We'd say that's kind of a, a wrong approach, traditionally sinful way of living, right? That's the younger brother. Let's look at the older brother. What, what, what did he do? He lived the life of moral conformity. I'm going to do the right thing. Life is best lived when living a good life, when fulfilling the expectations of family, community, a responsible life. Life is meaningful and full of purpose when these things are happening, right? It's a bit of a classic older and younger sibling kind of thing. But here's the shocking thing about the parable. It's the older brother that's alienated from God at the end. Hang on, what? But he was a good person. He was a moral conformist. He was doing the right things. How can this be? So we've got to conclude at the very least this parable is not teaching, don't live like the younger brother, live like the older brother. It's not doing that. The answer is not self-discovery or moral conformity. They're not the two only ways. There's a third way of living. And we desperately need it. Now let's explore that. This is what Jesus is getting at. Let's have a look at the older brother again. Ready? Why didn't he go into the feast? What did he say? This is what he said. Because I've never disobeyed you. That's what kept him from going in. The older brother is not losing the father's love in spite of his goodness, but because of it. What? Mind shift. It's his goodness that separates him, not his sins. And what we're seeing now is the hearts of both sons are really similar. How? What did the younger brother want? Freedom. Control. He wanted to control his life. And how did he get it? By grasping for it, by usurping authority. I'm going to get what I'm going to get by grasping for it. But the older brother, he wanted the same thing. He wanted control, but how did he get it? Through obedience, through doing the right thing. This is key, okay? The older brother, he wanted what the father had. He didn't want the father. In a different way, sure. This is the older brother. I've done all that you've expected of me. Now you owe me. You owe me. Now, how can we tell this? It's in his reaction. What was his reaction? What was his emotion? He was angry. Angry. This is what happens when good, moral people who live a good life make a bargain with God. Right? And it doesn't go their way. God, I'll live a good life. I'll do everything you kind of teach. But, but in return, you'll bless me. Elder brothers expect their goodness to pay off. 
I'll tell you what. You know the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace is being preached when good, moral, upright people get uncomfortable. <laughs> That's when you know the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is hitting its mark. It's okay, Pete, we've, done, we've gone past. Thanks, buddy. Okay, now what else can we learn about the older brother here? It's this. There's a real joyless fear-based compliance in his heart, right? Now, there's duty in everything, okay? If, you, if you're a parent, if you, you know, you're in a tough workplace, it's, there's duty there, of course, absolutely. But the elder brother reveals that's all he was on about. All these years, what do you say? All these years, I've been slaving for you. What was the point of that? It obviously hasn't paid off. There's no joy or love or reward in pleasing the Father in itself, we can see it through his actions of obedience. Let me tell you this story to help illustrate. Once upon a time, there was a gardener, very famous for what he did, and he grew an enormous carrot, okay? And he took it to his king. He said, Lord, this is the greatest carrot I've ever grown, or will ever grow. And I present it to you as a token of my love and respect of you because you are a good king. The king was touched. The king was wise. And he discerned the man's heart. He said, thank you. And then the gardener turned to go and he said, wait. Clearly, you're a good, faithful servant. I've got a field next to yours. I freely give it to you. To garden as you wish. Well, the gardener was delighted, amazed, and walked away. Now, there was a nobleman in the king's court who heard everything that went on. He said, oh. If that's what you get for a carrot, he came back the next day and he goes, My king, my lord, I present to you this magnificent stallion. It, I'm a horse breeder. It's the best horse I've ever bred or will ever breed. I give it to you freely as a token of my love and respect. And the king was wise. He discerned his heart and he simply said, Thank you, and dismissed him. He could see the confused look on the nobleman's face and the king said, let me explain something to you. Let me explain something. The gardener was giving me the carrot. You were giving yourself the horse. You see? The elder brother lived a good life and a moral life, was obedient to the father as a good thing. Right? I'm thankful people live these kind of lives. It makes the world better. But why was he doing it? for himself. When it didn't look like his way of living was going to pay off, what happened? He became angry. What have I been doing this for? And what does it reveal? His heart motivation, right? He was doing these things to get something from the Father, not doing them because he loved him. At the end, the elder brother has the opportunity to truly delight the Father by coming into the feast. The Father would have had both his sons in the celebration, but his resentful refusal shows the father's happiness has never been his goal, you see? Elder brothers obey God to get things, not God himself. Now, so what? Okay, that's interesting, Dave. Maybe I haven't thought about it like that before. So what? It's a big so what. It shows us a very different definition of sin, doesn't it? It's not just breaking the rules like the elder brother. That's easy. We can see that. He was so rude. How dare he? easy to see that's a wrong way of living but it's not just that it's putting yourself in the place of God as saviour lord judge I mean don't you reckon too often the Christian faith the gospel is just seen as moralism how I don't know how many times I've talked to people what do you think the Christian faith is like it's, it's about being a good person how many times have you heard that how many times do you say, oh, I'm not good enough? It's like, you don't get it. You don't get more good than the older brother. He did all the right things, ticked all the right boxes. Jesus shows us a radically different way. It's the gospel. It's not self-discovery like the older brother, nor is it moralism, ticking every box. It's more than that. It's just different. It's this. You ready? Let's offend everybody in the room. Everyone's wrong doesn't matter if you live a life of self-discovery or trying to tick every box you think life's about that everyone's wrong everyone falls short of the glory of God 
and everyone's loved. Everyone's called to recognize this and change. See, younger brothers and older brothers constantly try to rule themselves out. Oh, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're on the out, we're in. No, 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 they don't know. what. You, you're there on the out. You were, no, what does Jesus say? <laughs> the humble is in. The proud are out. The kingdom of God is very different. Friends, we need something radically different. This is what we need, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Utterly different. Let me end with this. In the two earlier parables, right, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, we've got a character there who seeks what was lost, don't we? In the third parable, we don't. I think that's on purpose. Why? We're meant to yearn for one who did. Stay with me on this. If I find my place. Okay, here we go. Right, there's a reason for it. It should have been the elder brother. What was lost? Not a sheep, not a coin. His blood, a wayward son, what would a good elder brother have done? Dad, I'll go find him. I'll seek him out at my expense. I'll find him. Like the shepherd in the first parable. But instead, the younger brother, tough for him, he's got a Pharisee as an elder brother. He's angry upon his return. The younger brother gets a Pharisee for an elder brother. But friends, here's the good news. We do not. Jesus is our great and true elder brother. What does he say to God the Father? I will bring them back at my own expense. See, someone's got to pay for the forgiveness of the younger son. At first glance, it seems like, oh, he's come back for free. No, 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 no. Remember what happened. At least a third of the inheritance is gone. So the father embracing the younger son back means that it's costly. It is costly to the older brother because it's his share of the inheritance that's now being spent on killing the fattened calf on a robe, on a ring, okay? And what's he doing? He's counting the cost of it. Oh, no. He's counting the cost, but Jesus Christ, he freely gives it. See, we have an elder brother that didn't go off to an, a far-off country to seek out his brother. No, 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 no. Jesus came from heaven to earth. See, we have an elder brother who was willing to pay not a finite amount of some sort of part of an inheritance to bring us home, but the infinite cost of his life because our debt was so much greater. And it only happens because the cross of Christ in our place. You see, there he was stripped of his robe. You know the story. He was stripped of his robe and his dignity so we could be clothed like the younger brother. On the cross, he was treated like an outcast so we could be welcomed into God's family. Friends, how does fear and anger turn into joy and gratitude? Here's how. When we are moved by the sight of what Jesus Christ has done for us, when we count the cost of what it took to bring us home, only the grace of Jesus Christ transforms our hearts and frees us from trying to control God. When we trust in his grace, we don't need to run from him in self-discovery because he's a good father. We don't need to earn his love by right living because we already know we freely have it. And then what happens? We're free to love and obey to see the beauty of Christ and his selfless act of love towards us changes a heart of running away and of dutiful, loveless obedience. I love an old hymn. It says it like this. To see the law of Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. We'll never stop being a younger brother or an elder brother until we acknowledge our need, rest by faith, and gaze in wonder at the work of our true elder brother, Jesus Christ. The invitation is clear. Come to the feast. Come to the Father's feast. Whomever you are, however you've been trying to live your life, however you've been trying to control outcomes, however you've been trying to control God, come into the feast. The Father's pleading. Well, friends, today, what we've done 
is we've set aside, hey Zach, we've set aside some time for prayer ministry, as is our rhythm here at Harborside Church. We do it every month. And we set aside some time for all of us to receive the gift of prayer. Now we're going to have our prayer team up here. They're just going to ask you two questions. The first one, they're just going to ask you your name if they don't know you. What's the name? What's your name? And then they're going to say, how can I pray for you? While that's happening, some music's going to be going on. Our hope and prayer is that every single person in this room would receive this gift. Who are you? Are you, are you more younger brotherish, Or are you more elder brotherish? Where is your heart at? Maybe you need prayer for that. Maybe you need to do business with God this morning. I'm going to invite the prayer team up now as I close. And our hope and prayer is that we wouldn't see this, what we're about to do, as they're the kind of weird people that go up for prayer. You know, someone walks up and they go, whew, I wonder how their marriage is going, you know. No, 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 no. Everybody needs prayer. The Christian life is hard. We are all experiencing difficulties. We all need prayer. Whatever is going on in your life, seek prayer for it. These people are going to ask, how can I pray for you? Maybe it's something directly from this message. I I need God to change my heart. You could just say that if you can think of nothing else. I need God, I need the Holy Spirit to change my heart. So I'm going to pray now and then I'm going to open it up into some free time. We've got time to come and experience some prayer ministry. And the band's going to play. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that it challenges us wherever we're at. Lord, I ask that you'd reveal to us, are we more younger brotherish or elder brotherish? Are we trying to control you in different ways? What's going on when we do that? We're not trusting you, but you are a good, good father. When we doubt your goodness, and we struggle to trust you, may we look at the cross where it's just undeniably true of what you did to bring us home. I want to pray for this special time of prayer ministry, that we would receive it as a gift and that you do work in our hearts and in the heart of this church. In Jesus' powerful name, amen.